Stephen, the latest exhibition here at the Ocean Map Library is the Golden Age of American Pictorial Maps. What is a pictorial map? Well, as the term suggests, it's a map with pictorial elements. Uh, these can range from uh, depictions of gods and goddesses in medieval maps, uh, the winds puffing up their cheeks and blowing the clouds, often seen in the corners in, uh, in medieval and early modern maps. And in the, uh, in the 20th century, they take on uh, pictorial elements showing our culture, so they can have people walking along the roads, people driving, people flying in aeroplanes, people in ships, um, a whole range of uh, pictorial elements are shown in these maps. And the ones in the exhibit here, what's the history of these particular maps that are in the, uh, in the exhibit? Well, this exhibition it aims to give an overview of the early history of uh, the genre of pictorial maps and then particularly concentrate on the American production of pictorial maps. And are they, they seem to be more artistic than technical. Yes, this is the, uh, the, the, the maps reflect a, a divide in cartographic production. On the one hand, you have scientific, objective, very technical maps, and on the other one has artistic, more subjective, indeed perhaps more creative uh, maps, and that's what we have on display here at the OSHA. And the one you're standing in front of is a map of London. Uh, tell us about that one. This is possibly the most influential pictorial map ever made. It was done by an English artist by the name of Macdonald Gill, uh, and it was done as a commission uh, for London Underground. Frank Pick, the director of the uh, London Underground, commissioned Gill to produce this map to advertise the underground services. It was uh, published in 1914, first as a very large uh, poster map that could be posted up on the walls of the, the London Underground. And it proved so popular that a smaller version was produced that could be sold to the general public. So it went through several editions, uh, the first in 1914, the one on display here, we think dates from about 1927. And it was the first of this very brightly colored um, uh, type of map with a lot of detail uh, crammed in. And it proved wildly popular in, in London and became influential in, in other parts of the world, uh, and particularly here in the United States. And there's another one uh, showing Boston that you're, that's behind you. Talk about that one. Yes, that one was done by Olson and Clark. Uh, it was commissioned by the Boston publishers Houghton Mifflin in 1926 as the first of three maps showing major American cities, Boston, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C. And I think if you can compare the McDonald Gill Wonderground map of London to the Olson and Clark map of Boston, you can see the similarities uh, Olson and Clark clearly knew Macdonald Gill's Wonderground map because they have certain, the, the map of Boston has certain similarities to the map of London. I think you can see immediately that the Boston map is crammed with detail. It's uh, uh, brilliant in its colours. And there are some details which are very similar to the London map. Notably, the roads are all picked out in yellow, which is exactly what Macdonald Gill did for London. And some of the major buildings in Boston are colored red, which is, again, an element that uh, Gill did on the Wonderground map. These maps seem to take a lot of research. They, a lot of the buildings are drawn precisely the way they look. It must take a lot of time to go around the town and sketch all of these buildings before you make the map. Yes, certainly Olson and Clark did spend many months in the Boston Athenaeum and the Boston Public Library researching the city and walking the streets, sketching the buildings, learning about the history of the town, and then they packed it in to their pictorial map of the city. We've jumped the Atlantic from Boston to Paris, so tell us about the map you're in front of now. Well, the exhibition is divided into several themes, and one of the themes we're showing are maps of places and regions. So we have several maps that depict cities or regions or states of the United States. We also have two maps from overseas, one of Shanghai and this map of uh, Paris by uh, Hungarian artist Ilonka Karatz. 
Uh, Alonka Karatz emigrated to the United States in the early 20th century. Uh, she settled in Greenwich Village in New York City and became a prominent decorative artist uh, for many decades. In fact, she uh, was a designer of uh, many covers for the New Yorker magazine, so very much part of the New York artistic uh, set. It's a very lavish map, as you can see, with striking colors, particularly the reds and the yellows, and the use of gold to pick out the streets is a particular feature of this map. Now, a map like this, it may not be totally technically accurate, but it, uh, but it, it provides information of a different sort. That's right. Uh, around the border of the map, there is a legend or key that's tied to the map and it explains all sorts of uh, information that a tourist might want to know about Paris, such as uh, restaurants and museums, uh, places to go and stay or to, to visit. When I look at a map like this, if I'm a tourist, uh, it helps me a lot because I can see the buildings, etc. But sometimes the distances always throw me off a little bit. So there little, little, seems to be a little trade-off on that. Yes, these maps were not done to uh, uh, scale. So there is distortion. Uh, they're reflecting the artist's vision of a place, or, a, or in this case, a city. And so uh, the uh, actual geography is played around with to uh, convey the uh, sort of artistic impression of the city. Stephen, we've seen how maps can help tourists and businesses, but they can also use for instructional purposes, like the one you're standing in front of now concerning Moby Dick. Tell us about that. Yes, this map was part of a series commissioned by the Harris Intertype uh, Printing Company of Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, they commissioned several artists to do uh, maps depicting great American and British uh, novels. The maps actually were part of calendars they distributed to their customers. Uh, the maps are instructive in that they show the major elements of great novels. Uh, this uh, particular map was done by Edward Everett Henry, a well-known commercial artist, and he was faced with the challenge of creating a visual representation of an American classic, uh, Moby Dick, by uh, Herman Melville. Uh, but he also had to integrate a map. And in many cases, uh, when we deal with literary maps, we often have names of the writers just put on a map. And there's very little attempt to evoke uh, a novel or short story. But uh, what Everett Henry achieves here is that fusion of imagery and cartography. So in the back uh, ground, we've got a map of Africa, uh, the South Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, going into the Pacific. And here is the voyage of the Pequod uh, in search of uh, Moby Dick. And here is the denouement when uh, the whale sinks the vessel. And you can see that the colors are starting to turn to this vivid red uh, as the uh, injured whale attacks the vessel, and we have the whale here ri rising up. It's a very dramatic map, probably one of the finest of the pictorial literary maps that was uh, ever created. These maps can also be used to help promote industry, and you're standing in front of one of uh, Cleveland right now. Tell us about it. Yes, American industry was quick to realize the advertising potential of pictorial maps. And so we have an early example here of dating from 1929, just three years after the Olson and Clark map of Boston. The map is an advertising uh, brochure for the opening of the Cleveland Union Terminal. Uh, this was a group uh, of office buildings, including the largest skyscraper outside of Manhattan at the time. And what this brochure was doing was advertising the centrality of the Cleveland Union Terminal uh, for the industrial Northeast. So the map shows the skyscrapers and office buildings uh, in the center of Cleveland near the lakefront. And then all of this transportation focusing in on the uh, Cleveland Union Terminal. Uh, we have got rail lines, we've got automobiles, uh, we've got Great Lakes shipping, we've got even aircraft coming in, focusing uh, on this great central place uh, entitled the capital of a new trade empire. So it's very much an advertising piece 
to suggest that locate your business in the Cleveland Union Terminal and you will be at the center of the economic activity of Ohio and beyond. Stephen, these maps can also be used for propaganda purposes. Tell us about the one that we're standing in front of now. This map was designed by Lambert Gunther for the Tom McCann shoe stores. And as you can see from the map, it was to reassure the American public that the United States was well defended. Uh, we have the uh, American Bald Eagle flying over the map, the Stars and Stripes, a very dramatic title, Safeguarding Our American Liberty. We have aircraft flying around the north of uh, North America and to the south here, the American fleet at sea. And if you look closely, there are patrol lines, plane patrol lines, fleet patrol lines around uh, North America. Uh, the actual United States is picked out in red, white, and blue, the colors of the flag. So it's a very patriotic uh, image of the United States, isolated and inviolable. The map was created in 1941. It's a pre-Pearl Harbor map, and American confidence, of course, was going to be shaken enormously by the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in uh, December 1941. We've come around about 50 years from the first map that we saw, the one of London. This is one of Los Angeles. Tell us about it. It's quite a change from Macdonald Gill's map of, uh, of London, of Imperial London, uh, and it's quite different also to the Clark and Olson map of Boston, whereas those two maps were full of confidence and pride in those two great cities. We now have a late 1960s image of Los Angeles, and it's really quite a dystopian vision. I think what's most striking uh, other colors. We've got this muddy brown at the top and this Pepto-Bismol pink here. And clearly these are the colors of the, of the 1960s, almost psychedelic. Uh, and if you start to look closely, you can see a very polluted city with smoke belching from the smokestacks, congested freeways, uh, a ship crashing into a harbor wall here. It's a very dystopian image of uh, Los Angeles, and indeed the sun here has got a clothes peg uh, on its nose and is looking in disgust at this uh, dreadful urban vision. How long is the exhibit open for and where can people get more information? The exhibition is open till September 29th, and information can be found on the web at oceanmaps.org.